Hello, alongside Ryan, sir. I'm Don Helbig, and welcome to The Pick 6, the podcast by the Attractions Group, where we bring you the latest and top stories from the attraction and amusement industry. Thanks, Don. Now, before we get started, just a reminder that we can be found on all your favorite podcast apps, Apple, Google, Spotify, you know the drill. Uh, we're also available on YouTube, where you can watch the video version. If you're watching on YouTube, thank you. Uh, make sure that you hit that like button, share with a friend, and hit the subscribe button if you haven't yet. Uh, but without further ado, let's get into it. Don, what's story number one? Story number one, Bush Gardens, Virginia, the iconic Loch Ness Monster roller coaster is resurfacing after months of restoration. The grand reopening is on May 10th with exclusive early ride access for Bush Gardens members from May 2nd to the 5th. This fan favorite, ordered over 45 years old, features large drops, interlocking loops, and a thrilling spiral tunnel section. I have to admit that when I went to Bush Gardens for the first time, I rode this to get it out of the way, and I ended up absolutely loving it. I think I cannot wait to ride it with all the updates and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's iconic. You know, it wouldn't be Bush Gardens without it. Yeah, I completely agree. Awesome. Cool. Well, let's move on to the next one. So we're heading back to Kings Island. Uh, so Kings Island in Mason, Ohio is making rapid progress on their new kids area, Camp Snoopy. WCPO got the first sneak peek showcasing the area centerpiece, Snoopy Soapbox Racers, a family roller coaster by Bacoma. Um, despite rain, kids from the Cincinnati Soapbox Derby Club unveiled the ride, which includes a 70-foot hill, a 36-mile-per-hour spike ascent, and a backwards return to the station. Camp Snoopy will offer new theming, landscaping, Rename rides like Woodstock's Air Rail, formerly Flying Ace Aerial Chase, and Pigpen's Mess Hall as a dining option. The area won't be ready for the park's opening, uh, but exact rides. Uh, but expect rides with Charlie Brown and friends later this spring. So we don't have an opening day yet, uh, but it's so. I, from what I'm hearing, the rumor is that it's testing. So maybe. Maybe it'll be ready sooner than we think. I mean, because it says Camp Snoopy will be ready late, late spring, not necessarily the ride. You know, it's difficult to say. You know, in some respects, you know, if you're opening up a new area, do you want to do it all at once? Mm -hmm. You know, or do you want to like, piecemeal it? And, you know, this ride's open, but the other part of it isn't. The restaurant's not ready. So, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how the park decides to play it. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's kind of stinks because I feel like there was no thunderstorm with uh, Adventure Port because it opened stagger staggeringly. Uh, it should have just if it opened with the park, it, it probably would have made a bigger splash. And I'm not blaming any one person for that. I, I understand the situation behind it, but you know, you had Cargo Loco that quietly opened, and then Soul Spin, which quietly opened, and then they had a Media Day, and the Media Day worked, but it was old hat by then because most people had ridden the ride already. Really yeah, and it was just, you know, just like the local media came out. So it didn't really get the big splash. It didn't have, you know, the big pool of, you know, the the different indi uh, industry um, influencers weren't out there. You didn't have a chance to get, uh, you know, media from some of the a little bit further out, you know, like Dayton, Columbus and that to come down and check it out. You didn't get uh, the different, uh, you know, enthusiast groups to, you know, kind of come in and be the first writers, you know, in the morning to get those great visuals and that board. Uh, so you're right. It just kind of just opened and, you know, it didn't really have the big bang that, uh, you know, usually you hope for when you open new attractions. So if anything, that might be a testament to just holding off on Camp Snoopy. Obviously the rides that are just being renamed, but are part of Camp Snoopy should probably open. But for this and the play structure and maybe probably pig pens, that'll probably be the last thing to open. Um, you have an opening date, open it that day and make it grand. Because if you trickle open it, no one's going to care. You know? Exactly. All right. Let's head to the next location. Oh, you get the Disney one? Yes, I do. A popular <laughs> Epcot attraction test track presented by Chevrolet will temporarily close starting June 17th for a reimagining phase. Disney released a rendering of the updated attraction, but really hasn't disclosed any details yet. Uh, the redesign draws inspiration from the original world 
of Motion Ride, as discussed in last year's Destination 23 presentation about future Disney theme park ideas. Imagineers and Chevrolet teams are collaborating on this exciting transformation. Yeah, so they haven't, um, I, I don't think they've released a lot of details about this, but Test Track is kind of unique in the fact that uh, the ride's been around for a long time, but it's been reimagined a lot. So it's always been Test Track. Kind of the substance behind it's been a little bit different from time to time. Uh, but with this latest version, you like build your own car and stuff on the screen. I wonder if they'll keep that. That'll be interesting. Or I wonder if this will be like an ad for hybrid or not hybrids for EVs. Do you, do you ever thought about that? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of possibilities there. It seems like, you know, like every three or four years that this is going through some kind of reimagining or, you know, maybe it's just, you know, that might just be me thinking that, but uh, you know, it, it's one of those attractions that, you know, if you're going to Walt Disney world, you're going to Epcot, you have to experience it. Absolutely. Now going over to its next door neighbor and loyal friend, Magic Kingdom, we got Tiana's Bayou Adventure. So this summer, Tiana's Bayou Adventure will transport Walt Disney World guests into the Princess and the Frog world at the former site of Splash Mountain. This reimagined uh, promises cutting edge technology. Adjacent to this, another frontier land attraction is expected to become a gateway to more magic. Disney Imagineering unveiled a $60 billion investment plan with 70% earmark for new park and cruise attractions and 30% for technology and maintenance. This ongoing expansion was discussed at the Destination 23 presentation, uh, hinting at changes to Disney's Animal Kingdom and potential new worlds inspired by Encanto and Indiana Jones. So I've been hearing some interesting rumors about this. About uh, So Big Thunder, uh, they were thinking about retheming it, but... Uh, the thing that was like they wanted to make that area kind of a bayou, like they want to do away with Frontierland. This is all rumor and speculation, but they want to they want to um, do away with Frontierland and make it like the New Orleans Bayou. But then you got this desert mountain, so they were thinking of like maybe Radiator Springs behind it, you know, kind of like a Disneyland. I think that would be awesome. I've always I haven't seen that yet, but from what I've heard, that's Radiator Springs is like the coolest thing ever. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's going to be a lot of exciting news coming out of uh, Disney parks, I think, in the in the foreseeable future here. Yes, yes, there will. All right, Universal Studios Hollywood and Knott's Berry Farm. They've been locked in a spooky showdown for decades during Halloween. Now these theme park titans, they're battling over signature flavors and dueling food festivals. You got butter beer versus boysenberry. The inaugural Butterbeer season is currently underway until April 30th at Universal Studios Hollywood, while the beloved Knott's Berry Boysenberry Festival is in full swing until April 28th. Ryan, if you only could choose one, which event would you go to? Probably Boysenberry because I've never been to Knott's Berry Farm, but I've been to, um, you know, I've been to Universal. Not this one, but I've definitely had butterbeer. Butterbeer is good, uh, but it's one of those things where it's so thick and so sweet that, you know, you can't necessarily uh, drink a lot of it, you know? No, I've had samples of the boysenberry uh, festival, you know, food items and that, and I would have to lean that way. I mean, that that's outstanding. Yeah. All right. So where are we heading next? So... You know, um, yeah, so let's talk about uh, one of your favorite subjects here. We have titles. So during Monday's total solar eclipse, scientists and zookeepers observed giraffes, gorillas, lions, macaws, and flamingos exhibiting unusual behavior. Researchers have limited knowledge about how eclip eclipse affect animals due to its rarity but zoos along the eclipse path like the fort worth zoo in texas witnessed mostly calm behavior but some animals such as gorillas lions and lemurs showed heightened vigilance and curiosity nocturnal animals like a ringtail cat and, and owls displayed increased activity during the daylight hours at the dallas zoo giraffes and zebras ran chimpanzees patrolled their habitat perimeter and an ostrich laid an, an ostrich laid an egg this news uh Birds of various zoos also react uniquely, with some becoming quiet, uh, and they were roosting during the eclipse. I noticed that, like, 
birds were chirping quite a bit. Like it was yes, like almost uh, definitely loud. Yeah, my neighborhood, the birds were uh, definitely chirping. That's interesting, man. The eclipse thing was fun. So it, if any, most of our listeners are obviously somewhere near a market, but uh, you know, the, obviously the Midwest, a lot of the United States got a kind of cool experience with uh, a total solar eclipse rolling through town. And, you know, we all got to check it out uh, this past Monday, but let's move Did on. Did you notice how, were you outside during it? I went outside a couple of times to check it out. Yeah. What caught my attention was the temperature drop. It just all of a sudden started getting a little bit cooler yes. in my backyard. So that was one of the things I wasn't thinking about that, you know, so I'm looking up at the sun you know, with the glasses and that, and then I just started, like, oh, I got to go in and get a jacket. This is getting kind of cold. Yeah. It, it, the w One thing I have noticed is uh, it's incredible. So when the moon was barely in front of the sun, it was incredible what like blocking 10, 15%, how much dimmer that made things. But on the contrast, it's incredible that like when it was in totality, how bright it still kind of was, you know, just yeah. from the, it's like the atmosphere scatters the light and stuff, you know, but yeah, it kind of looked like a black and white photo too. Like almost in my backyard, just of the trees and that everything just kind of dim like that. And then, you know, it happened and then it was over. Uh, but the temperature drop was the big, my biggest takeaway was I, I wasn't thinking about that. Yeah. And, um, that I always, it's always so eerie that like, well, it, what's funny is the way that I felt it and where I was, was not in complete totality, but it's really close, but it felt kind of like that dark dreary thing you get right before the rain just hits, you know, that's, that's what it kind of felt like uh, as far as like how it looked outside, but it's always funny when it hits totality and like lights start kicking on and stuff, how eerie that is. Uh, even though it happens every night when it gets dark anyway. So it's not such a rare thing, but yeah, uh, definitely an interesting story. And, you know, in like 99 years when the eclipse comes through again, let's compare the experiences. All right. Okay. Moving on to the listener question. This one is from David Maggs. He's from Kennesaw, Georgia. Uh, how do theme parks balance tradition and nostalgia with the de demand for cost cutting edge technology and modern attractions in their overall park development? What a complex question. Why don't you start with this one? <laughs> it's an, uh, an outstanding question. Uh, yeah, well, thanks for the question, David. I, I think, you know, when you're talking about balanced tradition and nostalgia uh, and, and what the demand would be for these uh, cutting edge technology and modern attractions, you really have to have a thorough understanding of, of your audience, your park's history. What do the guests want? Uh, what means what to the guest? Uh, I, I think one of the parks that does this extremely well is Kennywood. Yes. They yeah, take they a lot of their, uh, you know, older retraction attractions, which would be very easy to retire them and move on from them. You know, sometimes they're gone for a couple of years, but then they come back, you know, they, they refurbish them. So I think that's the park that I think when you're talking about that balance, tradition, nostalgia, uh, Kennywood does it exceptionally well, you know, with, with what they do there. There's some other, um, you know, parks out there that also do it very well. But yeah, there is that fine line. And it's, you know, sometimes you see parks, they just rip something out and replace it. And they don't really give a lot of thought to, to what that attraction meant uh, to their guests. You know, just the number of, you know, for a lot of people, it might have been their first ever ride uh, that they rode. It might be the first job they ever had. So there's a lot of that that you have to factor in uh, before you make some of these decisions. I agree. And I think another one that is not nearly as good as Kennywood, but I feel like if they had to do it all over again, they would have preserved some older attractions is Cedar Point. Uh, I think yes. Cedar Point, Cedar Point definitely, uh, you know, jogged their memory when they did the one fiftieth thing. And now they really celebrate their, because they've got 150 odd years of history where it's interesting and it's different and the celebrities have stayed there and they've got a hundred year old hotel and stuff. And that's just, that stuff is like, that's marketable, you know, and I even bought um, a hotel breakers hoodie last time I was there just because it like, you know, it had hotel breakers down the arm and stuff because it looked like, like, this is like an old it, like Hollywood tower hotel at, you know, at Disney, it, it reminded me of that. So I think it's cool that they celebrate such a thing, but yeah, it's very, I, cool. I think, yeah, I think it's very important to celebrate your history 
And, you know, I love the parks that, that do that. I always have this saying that, you know, when you look at attractions in a park, you know, your, your new ride, that's silver. You know, it's great to market and promote it this year, but it's, you know, silver. The, the things that have been around for a long time that have that history, tradition, been a part of, uh, you know, people's lives that have visited your park, that's gold. And you want to make sure that uh, you keep those attractions around uh, for future generations to enjoy. And, you know, again, I go back to Kennywood and just, you know, what a great job that they've done over the years of, of just preserving a lot of those, uh, you know, older rides that for a lot of parks, it would have been easy to discard them. Easy to discard. Excellent, excellent question. I really enjoyed that. All right. Well, that wraps up another pick six. Make sure that you follow us on all your fo- favorite podcast apps, Apple, Google, Spotify. Follow us on Twitter slash X at attractions underscore GRP. And check us out on YouTube by searching for the Attractions Group Podcast. We'll see you next week, everybody. Thanks for listening.